completed the program and finished module 10 and you're just on that maintenance uh, time before you take your NCLEX exam, this is a good way to be able to tweak and um, do any last minute check by looking at your client need categories um, and see how you're doing. So your instructor may have already given you to complete exams or quizzes according to these client needs. Um, another good thing to do is a reference of your mock exam. Again, I'm talking to those who have finished the program, have completed their last mock exam. Uh, take a look at the breakdown, and this can give you a good indicator what areas that you need to still work on or kind of tweak or check in on uh, based on how you scored on the mock exam. So use this as kind of a guide for that. Okay, um, so like I said, today uh, there are four subcategories with this particular client need, but we're going to be focusing first on pharmacological parental therapies, which include all of these categories, including medication administration, side effects, parental therapies, blood products, central venous dosage calculations. Um, also, with reduction of risk potential. It's another subcategory, and you could see that this involves things like abnormality of vitals, therapeutic procedure, diagnostics tests, labs, and so forth and so on that you could read on the screen. Oh, excuse me, I got a tickle in my throat. I apologize for the coughing. All right. So we're going to use our strategies like always, so I'm not going to spend time on this. You've seen these before. Again, if you're brand new to webinars and this is new for you, and you go to your Learn Upon dashboard, that's where you have all of your coaching and content webinars. They're recorded for your convenience. You're going to find that the first 10 webinars are what we call coaching webinars that teaches you different strategies. So you'll find things like uh, apples and oranges, therapeutic, SADA, priority, delegation, and umbrella principles. So you'll learn more how to utilize these particular strategies with certain questions. So make sure you check that out. Um, also, therapeutic communication is one of those strategies. The main strategy we use with our program we develop is the six steps to question success. This is the key, guys. This is what you need to use. You need to start practicing now using the six steps. Remember that the NCLEX is designed in a way that they answer questions using critical thinking skills. In other words, you need to learn to apply, analyze, and interpret the questions appropriately so that you know how to answer them. So it's not enough to just get good module scores and build your knowledge. Even though it is the foundation of critical thinking, that's not going to be enough to get you past your NCLEX. You still need to use these kind of strategies. And using the six steps is just a process. It allows you the opportunity to identify the question, understand it correctly, and avoid a lot of the testing errors that we see commonly when people are taking the exam. So using the strategies, practicing this is going to be essential. Each of your instructors has usually a Zoom or group call that they, uh, they create to help you understand how to utilize this. So make sure you sign up with your instructor if you haven't already. All right, here's our first question. You ready? Let's go. <clears throat> An elderly client's medication list is being reconciled by the nurse during his emergency room visit for a chief complaint of hearing loss. When asked by the nurse if there are other, any other medications that are not on the list being taken, the client reports that he has been taking furosemide, which was prescribed by his cardiologist. What should the nurse do? Mm, good question. Okay. So I'll give you a minute and 30 seconds to utilize this time so that you can answer the question. Again, if you're new, all you have to do is put in the question box, the answer choice you select.
All right, time is up. Okay, let's see how you guys did. All right, I see a lot of good answers. Um, let's take a look at this question again and break it down for you. So we have an elderly client, medication list is being reconciled in the emergency room visit, and the patient's chief complaint is hearing loss. When asking the nurse if there are any other medications on the list being taken, the client reports he's taking furosemide, which is prescribed by the cardiologist. What should the nurse do? So again, using our six steps, what should the nurse do about the fact that the patient is taking a medication called furosemide, which is our topic? The key word is that the patient has hearing loss. That's his main complaint. So we broke it down to the first three steps. Now we're in step number four. Let's define our topic. Always start out with the definition and expected outcome and goal. Those three questions you should ask yourself with number four of our six steps. So what is furosemide? Who wants to be the first to tell me what that is? What kind of medication is that? Okay. Okay, so the trade name, Natasha says, is Lasix. But its uh, diagnosis is, our uh, definition say loop diuretic. Absolutely. That's the definition, okay? Now, what is the expected outcome? What should this medication do, right? I think the definition basically explains that, but we expect this medication, if we give it to our patient, it's going to what? Increase urine output. Thank you, Winfred. Fluid loss, okay? Diuresa patient. It can lower the blood pressure. Yes. Um, increase urine output. Yes. Remove fluids. Reduce edema. Uh, diurese. Very good. Excellent. That's exactly what you need to do. If this was a question on the APLEX, you need to consider thinking about expected outcomes. Now, you probably said, well, I already knew that. But by just simply engaging in that thought, you trigger some things in your mind regarding the medication. Okay. So now, what should the nurse do if the patient is taking this medication? And how it relates to hearing loss. So now let's take this a step further and think about, well, is there any relationship between hearing loss and taking furosemide? Hmm. Is there? Is there not? Okay. I have, uh, Immaculate tells me it can cause autotoxicity. Okay. Well, yeah. That's an expected outcome. It, it, the potential is, the risk is that there could be hearing loss related to taking this medication. So what are we going to do about it? Okay. You see how much work we put into the question? We spent three quarters of our time on the question and less time on the answers. So now that we've kind of put all those ideas together and information, now we're better prepared to answer the question. Now, here's a strategy for you. When answering a question uh, that is not a priority per se, but you're going to ask yourself, is this a yes, is this a no, or it's a maybe? So let's go through our process of elimination first. Number one, tell the client that the age 75 years, it is inevitable that there will be hearing loss. Is that a yes or no, or true or false? Okay, so most of you are saying, no, it's false. You're right. That is not an expected outcome as we get older, okay? There's a lot of things that as we get older may be part of the aging process, such as weakened eyes, so you may have less vision, or your reflexes may be slower, or your organs doesn't work as well. That means like your liver and your kidneys may have more uh, problems with metabolism. Those are part of the aging process that is expected, okay? Now, there might be higher chance that a patient as they get older could have hearing loss, but it's not inevitable. So this is not true. This is not part of the normal aging process. So we can eliminate number one. Number two, report the hearing loss to the healthcare provider. Okay, a lot of you did select this as an answer because if 
we think back to our step four and we say, hey, there is a correlation between furosemide and hearing loss. Well, it seems logical that maybe the healthcare provider should know about it. So he could either adjust the medication or stop it, right? It would make sense. So we're going to hold on to number two as a possible answer. Number three, schedule the client for an autometric testing and hearing aid. Well, I don't know. What do you think about that one? He does have hearing loss, and it may be something that needs to happen at some point. But remember, what is the question? What should the nurse do? Is that the first thing the nurse is going to do? Is that appropriate at this time? No. Not necessarily, right? So the last one is tell the client that the hearing loss is only temporary. When the body adjusts to the furosemide, hearing will improve. Is that a true statement or false one? Yes or no? Is that something that will happen with the use of furosemide? And the answer is no. You're correct. It's false. Okay, hearing loss is, first of all, it's not inevitable, and it's not appropriate to make assumptions about the cause of the symptoms without thoroughly evaluating. So that's why we wouldn't do number three, and the client system will not adjust to hearing loss and will not resolve itself, okay? Uh, reporting hearing loss to the healthcare provider is going to be essential in this situation because um, there is a... Um, Autotoxicity can happen to be the use of furosemide, and so we need to promptly uh, report that to the physician, as well as any other symptoms like dizziness, tinnitus, uh, to help prevent permanent damage, which can occur. So we don't want permanent damage, but we definitely want to make sure the physician knows to stop the medication. It's probably what they're going to do. All right. Not bad for our first question, right? So far, so good. All right, but for those of you who did not get this answer, did you see the logic and how we came up with the answers by using certain strategies? Keep that in mind as we continue with the next question. A nurse should be most concerned with which of the following conditions observed in an Alzheimer's client being treated with lorazepam the daytime, for daytime agitation and sleep disturbance. So I'll give you a minute and a half to figure this one out. Okay, time's up. We ready? The nurse should be most concerned with which of the following conditions observed in an Alzheimer's client who's being treated with lorazepam for daytime agitation and sleep disturbance. 
Okay, so what are we concerned about? Here's a couple of things. Our topic here is the patient's taking lorazepam. But our key word is this patient has Alzheimer's, all right? So what is lorazepam? Remember, we're in step four. We always have to make our definition. What is lorazepam? What's the classification? Who can tell me what that is? Yes, thank you, Abin, uh, Abina is the one that was first. Benzodiazepine, right. Okay, that's what it is. Remember, we start with our topic, we think of our definition, but what is the expected outcome? What is this medication supposed to do? What is this supposed to do? Calm the patient, yeah benzodiazepines has a sedating or kind of uh, effect to relieve anxiety, uh, especially with people with agitation and other things. So we look at these kind of medication as used for this, this situation. So other expected outcomes. So because of the way it works, the expected outcome, it can do this, but it can also cause other problems. So we think about becomes habit forming patients could get overdosed on it it could get over a patient could use level of consciousness could be drowsy could do that but one other thing that is kind of common with patients who are on long-term therapy of benzodiazepine is that they can get what they call the opposite effect right instead of drowsing it could cause agitation this is one of those, one of those outcomes so keeping that in mind, that if, especially with somebody with Alzheimer's, typically we're dealing with older adults. This is one of the problems we see with patients who are on long-term benzodiazepine, especially if you try to wean them off of it or take them off too quickly, they're going to go into quite the opposite. So instead of being relaxed, calm, they're going to be super agitated, especially at night. So the correct answer to this question is really number one. Okay. Number one. So why is number two not correct? Extra pyramidal side effects. Now you could have easily had gone to the process of elimination and go, well, the nighttime agitation sounds like it fits our definition, but why is this not correct? Because this is usually associated with uh, antipsychotic meds, extra pyramidal side effects, is something that we often see with patients who are, have a history of depression or that are taking antipsychotic medications can develop these extra pyramidal side effects like the twitching or the um, certain shuffling and certain um, symptoms that are related to that. Vomiting is a hard one because it can happen. Vomiting is too general. Um, it doesn't really tell me a whole lot of stuff. And, concerning for a patient who's taking benzodiazepine. However, vomiting uh, could be uh, for perhaps a, a sign of withdrawal from the medication. Somebody's been on it for long term and they stop the medication. One of the signs and symptoms of withdrawal would be vomiting as well as sweating, those kind of symptoms. Anticholinergics is not really related to um, Lorazepam. So if we said this was a benzodiazepine, then it, you wouldn't see anticholinergic side effects because you would only see those side effects with anticholinergics. <laughs> so what are those? Um, anticholinergics could be um, usually um, antipsychosis medication, tricyclics. Um, examples could be even atropine or diphenhydramine. Those are anti-cholinergics. Uh, um, you're gonna see things like symptoms could be dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention, bowel obstruction, dilated pupils. Those are considered anti-cholinergic side effects. So they're really not related to the use of benzodiazepine, okay? So that's how we came up with that answer. All right, let's go to the next one. Okay, in order to promote and maintain skin integrity, the nurse should turn and reposition the client 
on bed rest every two hours. The plan of care should also include, and there you go. Okay, we're back. Let's take a look at this question. In order to promote and maintain skin integrity, the nurse should turn and reposition the client on bed rest every two hours. The plan of care should also include, okay? So let's think about our topic. We Our plan of care should include what? We're looking at skin integrity is our topic. That's what we're trying to do. We want to promote and maintain skin integrity. So what do we know about skin integrity? So let's think about it. What are some of the things you think about that puts a patient at risk for altered skin integrity? If that's what we're looking at, let's talk about expected outcomes, okay? So give me some things that could cause somebody to develop let's say wound ulcer, skin ulcer, so forth. So number one, Phyllis tells me circulation. Yes, that's a big one. If there's not enough circulation going on to an area of tissue, they're not getting enough fresh blood supply, that can cause deterioration of the skin. Immobility, even Fred said, you're absolutely right. Somebody who's sedentary, moving is a problem. Uh, let's see, we also had somebody said poor nutrition, right? That's a good one, okay? That's a big one because if they have a good nutrition, they're not going to be able to support their skin, their cells, and then you're going to get breakdown, breakdown of the molecules, right? So immobility. Uh, somebody says urinary incontinence. Yes, because that can cause irritation to the skin area and cause breakdown and be susceptible not only for that but for infections and other things. So. Yes, those are very good. Poor nutrition, uh, injuries. Yes, yeah, somebody has an injured area. Sure, they're open. They have an open area. Friction, good one. I like that one too, Phyllis. Uh, low immunity, Elijah, you got it. Um, malnutrition, Stephen, yes, perfect. Uh, soil linens, yeah, anything that could cause creases, bends, things if they're sitting for a long time in an area that's creased uh, could cause irritation, especially when we consider those paralytic patients that can't move on their own or reposition. Age, thank you, Winfred. That's another one. You guys are really doing good on this one. See what I'm talking about? It stimulates the thought process by thinking about the topic first. Now that we kind of think about all those things that can promote breakdown of the skin, if the idea is to promote skin integrity because we don't want it to break down, what are we going to do? Now we're ready for our answer choices. Let's look at number one, walking the client at least twice a day. Well, it says in the scenario that the patient's on bed rest. 
So I don't think walking the patient is really an option. If the patient could walk, then we wouldn't even be asking this question, would we? Okay. So we're talking about a patient who's bedridden. That's our clue. Our 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 clue. Yes. So we're going to eliminate number one. Number two, placing an indwelling urinary catheter. Now, for those of you who mentioned uh, urine incontinence, knowing that that is one of the things that can lead to poor skin integrity, now putting an indwelling urinary catheter could help with that, but also can introduce other problems, right? Like caudy. So in today's world, uh, Foley catheters is really frowned upon. Indwelling Foley catheters, Usually, that's a last resort. But you could leave this as a maybe. Remember, we said it's going to be a yes or no or maybe. So this could be a maybe, right? We're not saying no, but we're not saying yes either, okay? So let's hold on to this one for a moment because it does help with that urinary incontinence uh, part. Uh, number three, monitoring of the serum albumin levels, okay? Now, for some of you who said malnutrition, uh, those guys circulation, when you were talking about that, um, albumin being a source of protein that helps promote uh, um, molecules to develop and protect the skin, if you have a poor albumin level, it could be a sign of malnutrition, right? So, being malnutrition is a high risk for people with skin to develop poor skin integrity. I would say monitoring cell albumin seems like a really good thing to do. So I'm going to say yes to number three. Number four, monitoring the white blood cell count. No, that's only important if you suspect an infection, but that's not what the scenario is talking about. There's nothing to indicate the patient has an infection or creating one. So we can eliminate number four. So that narrows it down. Which is the better answer? What should we do? Is it better to put in a Foley catheter or monitoring serum albumin? Which one is going to give us a big bang for our buck right now? The answer being? Drum roll, please. <laughs> the answer is? Oh. Oh, there we go. I wasn't clicking. Monitoring the serum albumin levels, okay? Because really the biggest thing that's going to promote, maintain skin integrity is good nutrition, good circulation. Um, so by doing that, we, we want to make sure the patient does have a good albumin level. Um, and if it's low, then we're talking about a problem. Not only is it um, um, a decrease albumin level indicates malnutrition, but it's that risk factor for developing pressure ulcers. But remember, albumin is our protein that holds our fluids to. So not only if there's low albumin, you don't have enough um, cardiovascular fluids and you can get dehydrated and then causes less nutrition fluids to the skin, leading to further breakdown. So it's a big cycle there but albumin is the right answer to this one. You really do not want to put in a Foley catheter. That should be reserved only as a last resort for really critically ill patients that you have to monitor closely. If someone does need a Foley because they have urinary retention, they can't void completely, you're better off with intermittent catheterization than an indwelling catheterization, okay? All right, there we go. Good, good questions. Number four, a client is receiving two milligrams of morphine sulfate every four hours for post-operative pain. What should be included in the plan of care? Mm -hmm.
All right, time's up. Let's take a look. A client is receiving two milligrams of morphine sulfate every four hours for post-operative pain. What should the nurse include in the plan of care? What should we include for a patient taking morphine? Okay. Um, so what is morphine? You know, I'm going to ask you. You should know by now. Oh, morphine is what? It is a opioid. Yes. Okay. Opioid narcotic. And because it's an opioid, it works on the whole nervous system, right? Sympathetic is not selective, in other words. So, again, again, what's an expected outcome if giving somebody morphine? What are some of the things you would expect to see? Okay. Pain relief. Yes, that's the whole point of giving it. We hope that it will relieve the person's pain. Sedation can co be caused by morphine, drowsiness. You're absolutely correct. Those are things that are, re you know, affecting the nervous system, especially the sympathetic nervous system. And because it is an opioid and it affects everything, it could also depress your respirations, as Purity said, or it could even affect your level of consciousness. Sedation, respiratory, respiratory, decreased respiratory, you get a lot of that stuff. So those are some of the things to think about when giving morphine, okay? So it would make sense that um, I would conclude, include in my plan of care to monitor the respiratory status, level of consciousness, uh, effectiveness of the medication on the pain. Does it relieve the pain? Does it not relieve the pain? And so forth. So that's part of the plan of care. But what else will we include? Let's take a look at this list. Number one, should we assess the apical rate after each dose of morphine? Okay. Why would we do that? What would be the point? Okay. I mean, when do we when do we check an apical pulse? You know, you ever think about how often we do that? You know, um, Typically, in my nursing career, that's not a whole lot of times I listen to an apical pulse, but I would if I suspected that something was going on, like I have a weak pulse with, or it's irregular, and I wanted to get an accurate heart rate, I could be listening to apical pulse. Those are some reasons that you would do that, um, but I wouldn't necessarily have to do that after morphine. So no, I don't think it's necessary to do an apical uh, rate or check a, a apical pulse after giving morphine. Um, Sylvia says she would check an apical pulse if she's giving digoxin, and I agree. Carolyn said dig digoxin as well. Yeah, some of your cardiac meds. Uh, you want to get accurate rates. All right, sounds good to me. So we'll get rid of number one because that doesn't seem to fit our definition of morphine. Uh, should we assess for pedal edema? every four hours would you expect that giving somebody morphine is going to affect their fluid shifts and cause edema no <laughs> i'm thinking i don't see that happening i don't see the relationship of edema so that would not be necessary so we easily eliminated number two it's out of here Assess mental status every shift. Well, a lot of you said that it would affect the nervous system, would affect level of consciousness, you know, and we know that morphine could cause drowsiness. So I think checking a mental status is appropriate, don't you? But let me ask you this. Let's go back to the question. They're getting morphine every four hours. Are you going to wait to the end of the shift to check the mental status? Mmm, I see, said the blind man. Okay. Now, this is one of those testing errors that we often see when we look at an answer that seems appropriate, but half the answer is correct, but the other half is not. In this case, assessing the mental status would be appropriate, but you would not wait to the end of the shift. You would need to do it more sooner more sooner how you like that for grammar okay so sooner right so it doesn't seem number three would be correct remember if half the answer is wrong 
that the whole answer is wrong. It only leaves us one answer left. Assess urine output every eight hours, right? It's, it's the only one left that even remotely sounds right because we've dismissed all the other three, okay? So why would number four be the correct answer? If the others are wrong, what makes number four correct, okay? How does it relate to morphine? Well, remember we said our definition, our diagnosis, our definition of morphine is an opioid that affects the nervous system completely. So morphine can cause urinary retention. Yes, because again, it's affecting the, the sympathetic nervous system and patients can have this as a side effect or an adverse effect of morphine is urinary retention. So we want to monitor the urine output and every eight hours is appropriate uh, to do, okay? So that's why number four is the correct answer. All right. How are you guys doing? So far, so good. Are you guys getting the answers or you're just kind of like, oh, going back to the drawing board? Use your strategies. Let's try another question for you. See you get it this time. All right. Good job, Esther. Okay. The nurse is providing discharge teaching to a client being treated for streptococcal pharyngitis. The nurse teaches the client she needs to use a backup contraceptive method in addition to her oral contraceptive because medications that may interfere with the efficacy of oral contraceptives include. All right, this is more of a knowledge question. Either you know it or you don't. Okay. So which of these medications could interfere with the contracept oral contraceptives? I'll let you try. Okay, let's see how you guys did. It says here the nurse is providing discharge teaching, uh, a client being treated with streptococcal pharyngitis, and she nurse teaches the client she needs to use a backup contraceptive method in addition to her oral contraceptive. Because medications that may interfere with efficacy of oral contraceptives include, okay? So this is one of those, like I said, it's a knowledge question. You either know it or you don't. But let's take a look at some cues or clues. So we're looking at the fact that the patient has, there's certain medications the patient's on being treated for streptococcal pharyngitis. How do we treat step, strep? How do we treat it? Yeah, a lot of you said we treat it with antibiotics. So it seems like we're talking about antibiotics here. So the question is, is number three correct or not? Okay. Would antihypertensive interfere with contraceptives? I don't see the connection there. Neither does diuretics or even antihistamines. 
So if we were just being logical here and not even using a lot of critical thinking, it's like, well, the only answer that makes sense would probably be antibiotic because why would I be giving antihypertensive to somebody with streptococcal pharyngitis anyways, okay? Sometimes the clue is right in front of you. And you just need to use that. So the answer is correct, antibiotics, okay? So just so you know, anti broad spectrum antibiotics can cause decreased efficacy of oral contraceptives. So placing the client at risk for like an unplanned pregnancy. So when the client is prescribed a course of antibiotics, a backup method of contraception should be used where the others, there's no correlation. Okay. Now I said that it can cause decrease. It doesn't say it will, but it can. Okay. So that's why we want to educate our clients correctly. All right. Okay. Now we are ready for our case study. How about that? Okay. So just like we use our six steps to kind of answer those questions, we use the clinical judgment model to help us identify through the case study. So as you can see, step one, we're gonna recognize those cues. So on the NCLEX exam, I strongly recommend that you write down the cues as you go through the case study. So you're not missing any details that could be important part of answering the questions, okay? You're gonna analyze the cues and come up with a hypothesis and then so forth and so on. So let's go ahead and take a look at this first, this case scenario. We're going to call uh, KB as Ken. Ken is a 27-year-old Caucasian male who presented to the emergency department with complaints of chest tightness and difficulty breathing. He reported a history of general fatigue, fever, and productive cough for about a week. He is 180 centimeters tall. He's 74 kilograms. Now, he doesn't take any other medication and has no other significant medical history. He has no known drug allergies. He is a construction worker. He lives with his girlfriend and smokes two packs of cigarettes a day for the past five years and drinks four to eight beers on the weekends. All right. So we're going to start out with our very first question is to highlight findings of concern now let me just give you a, a tip when you get to the NCLEX and you're doing a case study they may or may not ask you to highlight the things that stand out so if they don't ask you do it anyways in other words write it down on your whiteboard all of the clues uh, what's going on with this patient what stands out okay now, let's go through this together, and you tell me what we need to highlight and what we don't. So he's a 27-year-old Caucasian male, okay? He came to the emergency department. Now, he complains of, yes, chest tightness, absolutely, with difficulty breathing. So that would seem like something I would take note of. Yeah, next Difficulty breathing, is that something I should highlight? Sure. He reports general fatigue, fever, and a productive cough. Makes sense, right? How about here? Well, the height and weight, there's nothing there for me to worry about. He's not taking any other medication. He doesn't have any allergies. Now, he's a construction worker. He lives with his girlfriend. But what do you think about the smoking? Yeah. And what else? Well, let's take a note of the fact that he likes to drink. Okay. So those are things that highlight. Now, look at the highlight areas. Do you have a hypothesis yet? Do you have an idea of what's going on with this patient? If you had to give me a diagnosis right now, what would it be? Interesting. Some of you said COPD. Somebody said pneumonia, tuberculosis, emphysema, lots of COPD, pneumonias. Okay. All right. I can see why you would say COPD.
Okay. So hang on to that thought. Okay. Let's take a look at the next question. Now, look at these labs. Anything stands out to you? Yes, Jerry. The WBC is to be elevated. So, based on this new data, does your original hypothesis is still good or you're thinking you want to change your mind? Now, what do you think about your hypothesis? Okay. Wow, Faith went a whole lot. She went COPD with core pulmonal. But I'm seeing a lot of pneumonias now. So some of you said original COPD. You still think it's COPD or you think you're leaning towards more pneumonia now? Okay. Yeah, I, I'm looking at this. Uh, chest x-ray has pleural effusions. And it says that he has a left lower lobe pneumonia. So had this not told us that already, I think the clues are there to tell us that our original hypothesis, it's either going to be confirmed or denied. I like that you said COPD. It was a strong contender, but now we get more information and now we can say, eh, maybe it's not COPD. Maybe it's more on the pneumonia side. Now that we have an x-ray to tell us that's what it is, now we know we're dealing with a patient that is here with pneumonia. Okay? Now, let's go on with our next question. Now, the doctor has wrote orders for regular diet, activities, vital signs, oxygen um, as needed to keep the stats above 92, normal saline at 75, and he's starting the patient on cefriaxone, one gram IV piggyback Q12, these are antibiotics, and he can have acetaminophen for temperature. Okay, so that's what we know so far. Let's go to the next question. Now the question here. On the left is all the stuff that we've already looked at. If you were on the NCLEX, this would be in different tabs, but it's all now on one page. The question is, after reviewing the admission note, physician orders, labs and imaging results, the nurse recognizes specific patient teaching that should be added to the plan of care. The nurse teaches can blank that he needs to blank in order to help. Let's start with our first blank. Okay, the nurse teaches Ken what? One, do you think he needs to drink 10 cups of water daily? Is that gonna be appropriate right now? Yes or no? Okay, I got some no's. Some people said he needs more than that. Okay, some people say yes. Okay, so let's hold on to number one as a maybe. Remember, it's yes, no, or maybe. Number one is a maybe. Do we want Ken to eat a high protein diet? Not a bad idea, but he needs what more than protein? Probably needs more high calories, right? Because he's burning up so much energy and just trying to fight off this infection that high calories um, along with protein would be good. So do we want him to deep breathe and cough? Okay. Yes, no, or maybe. It's another yes. Okay. Number four, flush his kidneys to prevent a UTI. Mm. Let's see, what was his creatinine? Let's go back to our last. His creatinine was 0 0.9 and his BUN 12. Was he at risk for getting a UTI? Mm -hmm. His labs are good. Doesn't seem like he had a Foley catheter or anything else to indicate that he may be at risk for a UTI. So I think we could eliminate number four. Do you want to clear his mucus from his lungs? Well, that's going to be our second. I'm sorry. We need to start with number one. Number one is the first three. Um, the nurse teaches Ken that he needs to, one, 
either drink 10 cups to eat a high protein or deep breathe and cough. Which of those three answers, one, two, or three, is probably going to be the right thing, the priority? Okay. I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself there. So the answer is A, yep, deep breathing cough. That seems to be the most important thing right now. In order to do what? If we teach them to deep breathing cough, what is it going to do? Is it going to help to flush the kidneys? Is it going to help in clear mucus from his lungs? Or is it going to help to avoid weight loss while in the hospital? Okay. That's kind of dumb answers, right? So I think that was obvious. Okay. Good job. Okay. So let's move on to the next question. All right. So now after we've given cephroaxone, which is the antibiotic, uh, has been infused for about five minutes, Ken calls the nurse's station stating, it feels kind of funny. The nurse returns to Ken's room and performs an assessment. What should alert the nurse that Ken is having an anaphylactic reaction? Select all that apply. Okay, I'm going to give you a minute to give me your answers. So remember, here's the numbers. You can pick what, however many numbers you want. Good job, Claire. You got it. Marie Claire also has it. All right, let's take a look at this question. Remember, one of the other testing errors that I see, I already mentioned one of them about looking at the answer and half the answer being wrong. Another testing error that is common is you're not reading the instructions carefully. You're not understanding what the instruction is asking. This is asking what would alert the nurse if the patient is having an anaphylactic reaction it's not asking you is if he's having an allergic reaction there's a difference between someone just having an allergic reaction to something versus somebody now is having an anaphylactic reaction or going into shock big difference isn't it so you need to differentiate between the two so let's take a look at number one swelling of the tongue yeah, it's an allergic reaction, but it's also a sign of somebody having an anaphylaxis reaction. So that is definitely correct answer. Not a red rash on his face or arms. Yeah, you can have a, an allergic reaction and have red rash in arms, but not necessarily mean you're going to be anaphylactic shock, are you? How many of you have ever had a rash and your face and arms get red? Doesn't mean you're going to, you know, go to call 911, right? It just means you're having an allergic reaction. You might need to have it treated with some medication, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean anaphylaxis. Neither is swelling the face and circumorbital uh, on the face. You can have some swelling, 
face, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean or specifically anaphylaxis. Now, when your voice and throat tightens up and you said you're closing your airway, yes, my dears, it, it, it mean that you're having and going into maybe anaphylactic shock. Again, hives on the face and arms. Nope, that can be allergic reaction as well as abdominal pain. But if you're severely shortness of breath and having dyspnea, that certainly is a response to that. Uticaria, also a rash or it could be allergic reaction, um, but not necessarily anaphylaxis. But persistent cough, is a yes. And paleness, absolutely. It shows the patient's going into shock. So this is why it's important that you identify and look at the instructions so that you're not getting too, too confused, okay? So even though everything on this list may be related to a allergic reaction, only specific things tell you we're going beyond an allergic reaction, and now this is a person that is, is in danger because they're going into anaphylaxis and may go into shock. Does that make sense now? It's like the light bulb go off, hello? <laughs> okay. So be careful when you're reading the instructions that you know what you're answering. Okay, is this okay? This is why you're here. This is why we have this so we can learn from it. This is a common testing error we see on the exams all the time. Why people miss questions, not because they're not knowledgeable or they're not smart about it, it's just because they didn't read the question entirely and understand it. All right, let's go on. Now, here are the orders. The patient got epinephrine orders, saline bolus orders, um, diphenhydramine order, albuterol, rantidine, um, methylprednisone. So these are the orders that the physician ordered for this patient in response to this anaphylaxis. So now the nurse obtains a new set of vital signs. Heart rate right now is 130. Respiration is 36. The blood pressure is 88 over 56 and implements measures to manage the anaphylaxis reactions. So we know the patient's having anaphylaxis and is going to shock. And the big key for shock is that BP of 88 over 56, okay? We see the heart rate is tachycardic and his respirations is very fast. So what we're going to look at this list and we're going to say put it in the order. What would we do first? Think about what's going on with this patient. So let's go through this and let's first start out with what would be number one. Would we place the patient in supine position? Do you think that would be the priority? Is it called the HCP? Administer diphenhydramine. Call rapid response. Stop the cefriaxone. Open the normal saline. Administer epinephrine apply O2. Which of these do you think should be first? And you can use this, you can say this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can just put a number if you prefer to do it that way. Okay, I'm liking your answers. A lot of you already, before I even finish saying anything, already said that they like stopping the cefriaxone. Sephri or antibiotic. Yes, that is the culprit. That's what's causing the problem. We need to stop that immediately. Um, what would be number two? So now we've stopped the medication. Makes sense. What do we want to do next? Okay. Now we have an emergency going on here. Okay. Um, Somebody going to anaphylactic shock can go and die, right? So what do we want to do next? Okay, a lot of you selected call rapid response. Yeah, let's get all hands on deck. It's like calling a code. If somebody was not 
uh, doesn't have a pulse, there's a lot of things we could be doing simultaneously, but one of the things we want to do is get more help, right? So we're going to call a code. In this case, we can call a rapid response team if your hospital happens to have one, okay? Uh, but you got to get help. Or if you don't have a rapid response team, just go, I need help in here. <laughs> Let's get all the nurses, everybody there, because you're going to need to do things simultaneously. So, okay, so now we stop the medication. We're calling for help. You're the nurse. While help is coming, what do you want to do next? What's going to be important to do? Remember, this patient is going into shock. Okay. So the next thing we want to do is administer epinephrine. Yes, we need to stop this reaction. Okay. What is epinephrine? What is that going to do? You know, when we think about that. Right? What is it going to do? Epi? Epinephrine? Who wants to give me the definition of epinephrine? Okay. Okay. Nobody wants to give me the definition of epinephrine? Yeah, sympathomimetic, right? It's going to cause what? Vasoconstriction. More importantly, it's going to produce... Uh, everything to shift to the core. This is why we give epinephrine not only in allergic reactions like this, but we give it during CPR. Why? Because we want to draw all the blood, all the supplies to the core of the body. That's why when somebody is going into shock, they're going to be pale. They're going to be diaphoretic, cold or clammy. Why? Because the skin is the largest organ of the body. So the body is saying, look, skin, we don't care about you right now. We're going to sacrifice you in the moment because we got to protect the vital organs like the brain, the heart, the kidneys, the liver. So we want to bring all the supplies, all the blood and to the core of the body to support the vital organs. It's all hands on deck. And that's what epinephrine do, does. Think of epinephrine as the, the, the one medication that's going to be um, to bring everything to the core. over there i'm sorry that my other phone is ringing i'm like who's calling me all right um so i'm sorry for that so that's what epinephrine does so it's an emergency drug because right now we need all the support and help we need think of it as your your helper okay so now we've got epinephrine we're pushing epinephrine what do we want to do next okay so next we want to put the patient supine why uh, we don't do reverse Trendelenburg anymore, right? Um, it's usually not anything that we, we do. We could do a modified, but putting the patient flat, again, it's the same purpose. Let's bring venous return to the core of the body, to the heart. Uh, so we we're, we're basically want everything to come back into the middle of the, of the heart area uh, to promote that, promote that venous return. So that is why putting a supine can also help along with the epinephrine for the same purpose is they so constricted bring all the blood to the core of the body. So that's an easy, quick thing to do. You're going to do that simultaneously. You're getting the epi, you're putting them down. So now what? What else we want to do next? So, so far, so good, right? We're, we're rocking and rolling here. So next we want to do is, yes, apply oxygen via mask. Why? Look at the respirations. It's 36. He's breathing very fast. That means he's oxygenating, but he's not ventilating. There's a big difference there. Okay. Just because he's got a fast rapid rate could be that he's also getting rid of CO2. He can be even hyperventilating, causing metabolic acidosis and so forth. So what we want to do is get slow down that breathing, get as much oxygen on board so we can perfuse those organs so we can bring perfusion back to the heart the lungs the kidneys the liver all of that circulation so oxygen is going to be important and we want high flow oxygen so we want to be a mask we're not going to put a little bit nasal cannon and give them about two or three liters no <laughs> we want a lot we want to get that back up um we don't have our spo2 here do we but regardless this is the whole idea behind giving that much oxygen Okay, now what's next? 
open normal saline again when somebody goes into shock the blood pressure is going to bottom down so we lose our volume okay so it's going to be a high priority to give fluids because we need to raise that blood pressure so we can again reserve and reperfuse these organs and put them up there okay so that would be another thing to do now i know some of you are saying i'm giving i'm stopping my antibiotics and i'm a, i'm going to open my normal saline if you happen to have normal saline hanging there already uh, because typically when you give antibiotics you're giving it as a piggyback then it makes sense i'm shutting off my my um, antibiotic and i'm opening up my normal saline yes you would do that that's in the real world Okay, the way this thing is ordered this way, I know the real world would be doing multiple things at the same time, but you can tell it's one of the top six things to do, okay? And it's more important to understand the why behind we do what we do. What's the purpose? What's the rationale, okay? And then we're gonna uh, go ahead and administer diphenhydramine, which is your Benadryl, right? Your H2 um, blockers. Okay, because that works with the allergic reactions. So you want to drive those those uh, cells, those um, H cells, and, and and drive them back into the cells. When that's what we're doing with that. And then finally, call the physician. Wow, he's the last to know, right? Um, it seems that because a lot of times we're tempted to say when a patient's in the emergency, I'm going to call the doctor first, but not necessarily when there are things that you're capable of doing as a nurse when there are things that are available to you you see you can give these meds because you already have the order for them now if you didn't have an order for epinephrine obviously you would be calling the doctor because you need to do that as a priority um, you're going to call them um, but if you have what you need to take care of the patients use what you have you know you're the nurse you need to make sure that you're intervening appropriately by giving the patient especially if you have what you need to take care of the patient um, in an emergency like this okay does that make sense interesting right you know you could maybe argue one or two which one go first which one go second honestly i'd be doing stopping this and i'll be opening up my fluid personally that would is what i would do because my big concern is this blood pressure 88 over 56. my priorities is i need to give volume i need to get that blood pressure up okay so that's going to be my top priority uh along with calling the rapid response and giving epi i'd be like i would have put this up here but i didn't write this question this is not wrong i'm not saying this is wrong i'm just saying that you could put the saline first and is what I would have done. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Are we done? No, we have another question. We're not done with Mr. Ken here. Now, time has passed and now it's 1930. On the left, we see the client is stabilized and resting in bed. He continues with his oxygen. Now we put it down to four liters per minute, nasal cannula, I'm assuming that. Instruct a client to call for help before attempting to get out of bed. The rash in the hive still present, but subsiding. Mild wheezing noted in all lung fields. There is decreased sounds in the bases. Ronchi, left lower lobe, peripheral pulses are plus two. Facial edema subsiding. Order received to change antibiotics now to level floxacin, 500 IV piggyback daily. First dose is due at 2,200 hours. The orders, diet is regular, up at lib, uh, vital signs, SPO2 every four hours, oxygen at four liters to keep the SATs above 92, the saline, the, the antibiotic, and acetaminophen. Now, Ken tells the nurse he can't believe this happened. He has never been sick or had any allergic reaction in the past. The nurse's best response regarding allergy include all of the following except, what would be the exception here of these answers, one, two, three, and four, go for it.
All right, guys. So what do you think? So we have a patient, uh, can, can't believe what happened, and the nurse's best response, including allergy, include all of the following, except, remember, this is an exception. In other words, what is not true when it comes to allergic reactions? Remember, instructions is important. So number one, allergies can develop at any time, true or false? The answer is true, they can. We've got a lot of adults who said, hey, I've never been allergic to this before, and suddenly now they're allergic. Why things happen? Who knows? We don't know why that happens. It could be something to do with the atmosphere. It could be something in the foods or the preparation. Who knows? But it's true. Allergies can develop at any time. Number two, now that you know that you're allergic to cefriaxone, you should never take it again. Right? I would be telling them true. Now he's got allergies to that. Hey, hello. Don't ever take that again. Make sure you carry a med alert uh, band or make sure it's in your medical records or make sure you tell the staff every time you go to an ED or somewhere, you let them know what your allergies are. This should be included. Number three, cefriaxone is a cephalosporm antibiotic. These can be cross-sensitive with penicillin antibiotics as well. True, false, the answer is, it is true. So in addition to telling people uh, that you are allergic to cefriaxone, you should avoid taking penicillin as well because there's cross-contamination, cross, I'm not contaminant, cross-sensitivity, I apologize. Um, so yes, they should avoid penicillin as well. That leaves us, if those three are correct, let's take a look at the last one. You will need to always carry an EpiPen from now on. Uh, no. It's not likely that Ken's going to walk around and inadvertently give himself some separate to Axon, is he? No, he doesn't need an EpiPen. EpiPen is for those allergic reactions, people who have natural allergies to certain things like bee stings or um, other things that they may be exposed to inadvertently, okay? So, but that's not something that he would be inadvertently uh, exposed to. So he doesn't need the EpiPen. So the correct answer, obviously, is number four. You guys, you guys did very well, okay? Any questions? I think we're done with this one. We're all done. I can't believe we actually finished on time. <laughs> I'm always over. Question seven. One doesn't drink enough water, you will have mucus come out effectively during deep breathing coffee. Yes, you want to give fluids because you want to hydrate. Let's go back to number seven that she's referring to. Or he, yeah, Dora is referring to number seven. Okay, so, all right. So, uh, Pisha, Ed, Planket, the nurse teaches Ken. Uh, so if you said drink 10 cups of water, uh, you do want them hydrated, but you got to be careful they don't go into fluid overload. It's, it's kind of saying which is the better answer, you know. Sometimes with these questions, it's not to say one answer is wrong, but which is the better answer, okay. In this case, deep breathing and cough exercises to me seems a little bit more important than the fluids because you also want to be able to inhale and get more air ventilation as well as being able to get rid of the secretions. But I agree, Dora, as sometimes, you know, you kind of, you do have to give some fluids so that you can thin out those mucus, okay? Fluids will moisten the secretions and easier to expectorate. But you know, if you have to pick one over the other, still the deep breathing coffee seems to be more appropriate for somebody with pneumonia, okay? At least in this question, all right? Um, okay, let's see what else. In assessing mental status at the end of the shift is too long. Is in assessing urine output every hour is equally too long? No, not really. I mean, because usually morphine to build up enough morphine to cause uh, urinary retention is not going to happen very quickly. It's accumulative. 
you know, so that's something that you probably would not have assessed or noticed after a one hour. So usually by the time morphine has that reaction to cause sympathetic effects of urinary tension, it's going to take a couple of hours. Now, you know, with anything else, if you have a urine output of less than 30 an hour, yeah, but you're not going to, it's not likely. In other words, it's rare that this happens. So it's not like you give patients morphine, they're going to develop this. If you're giving somebody morphine chronically, that means you know they're they're taking it literally every four hours. You're giving that morphine for whatever reason that their pain is not controlled. Then after a cumulative of morphine being given over and over and over again, it could affect the urine and cause urinary retention. But that's not something you're going to see like in an hour. Okay. Now there are other things that can can do that, but that one is not one of them. Which brings us back to pain medication brings us back to how do we manage patients pain this is just another important um, topic to think about uh, you need to have a multi approach to pain always remember that yes they might need the opioid for really high pain but think about what type of pain they're having it's just as important if they're just coming out of surgery and they have general pain because they just had major cut of their abdomen open, yes, uh, uh, opioids may be appropriate and you want to wean them off, but what if they're having something like they had a broken leg, um, they have initially pain, but they're going to have also inflammation and spasms, right? So sometimes you want to alternate medications and say, well, I'm going to give you the morphine every eight hours, but every four hours we can give you an antispasmodic or with an anti-inflammatory so that you can alter the medication so you're not accumulating these opioids um, and using just one approach to pain. And that's another thing that we don't do very well you know, in this country is manage patients' pain well. So you got to kind of look at alternating medications, you know, whether you give an opioid and then alternate that with an NSAID or something like Toradol, or uh, it's important that you understand that some of these medications accumulatively can cause other issues. I know I, it was a long explanation for a short answer, right? Sorry, <laughs> I got carried away. Uh, so the mental status assessment should be every every dose. Well, it should be more frequently than Q shift. So yes, think about your peak time for your medications. Usually in general, when we talk about pharmacology, when they're asking you to observe any kind of reaction, think about the onset of that medication. For example, if you give somebody a rapid uh, insulin, short acting insulin, when are you gonna watch for hypoglycemia? You're not going to wait an hour and a half to say, oh, I'm going to check them back for hypoglycemia. No, you're going to watch them within that 30 minutes uh, uh, to, to an hour because you know when that medication will peak. It's the same with thing, same thing with antihypertensive. You give a blood pressure med like, um, let's say, cardizem, for example, you're not going to wait four hours to see if their blood pressure drops right? You're going to watch in the first 15 minutes to see how initially they respond. So it depends on when the medication peaks. Morphine, if you think about when it, it um, not peaks, but um, starts to take effect, the onset, that's the word I was looking. Look at the onset. So if you give morphine for the very first time to a patient who's never had morphine, you should be checking them in 15 minutes to see how they respond to the morphine. Are they having an allergic reaction? Are they dropping their blood pressure very rapidly? Are they having levels of consciousness? And then you can spread it out and say, okay, check you in an hour. So it depends on the onset of the drug to determine what kind of reaction are you looking for. Somebody said they wanted to see number one. I don't know if I can go that fast. Let me, I would have to escape from here and then go this way all the way to number one to get to number one. There we go. Slideshow from current. What was number one? I forgot which one this was. Okay, this is the patient with the hearing loss. Okay, so the complaint is the patient's here with hearing loss, but the scenario says that the patient's taking furosemide. Almost they're trying to give you a clue and say, hello, maybe there's a connection between furosemide and hearing loss. That's kind of what it's telling you. So what should the nurse do? Well, 
we know by thinking about this topic that furosemide has got a known history of causing autotoxicity. This is an, an, an outcome that's a risk or an adverse effect of furosemide. Therefore, the right answer to this question is we're going to notify the healthcare provider because we see the relationship between the keywords here, the topic and the keyword. Still have hives. Uh, divine, the patient still has hives. Hence, I was wondering why it's not part of the signs as we selected. Because it is a sign of an allergic reaction, Divine. But it's not necessarily the sign of an anaphylactic reaction. Okay? You can have rashes. You can have signs of an allergic reaction and not necessarily go into anaphylactic shock. Right? I mean, how many of you have ever been allergic to something? Okay. I, it happened to me, to be honest with you. I got one time many, many years ago, my son was still a baby. And I was outside and I stepped on the mound of red ants. You know, those really giant big red ants on my leg. Oh, my God. I was in pain. My foot was swollen. All right. As you can imagine. So I come in, I'm in tears because this is painful, it's swollen, I'm putting ice on it, I'm taking care of it, and I'm thinking, okay, I just had a reaction to ant bites, okay? I'm thinking it's local because my leg was getting red, okay? I started to get a rash on my leg. So I'm still thinking, okay, this is a local allergic reaction to the ants, and here I am a nurse, okay? I started not feeling so good, and all of a sudden, I couldn't hear very well. Everything seemed muffled. Um, I went into the bathroom, and when I went to go to the bathroom, and I'm getting a little personal here, getting go pee pee, right? I noticed some things were swollen, <laughs> and I panic. I'm like, "Oh, what the? You know what? I'm like having this really allergic to reaction." So what I did dummy me told my friend to stay with my baby and I drove a couple of blocks away to the nearest clinic. I walked in and I barely got to the counter when I passed out. I went into anaphylactic shock uh, from the ant bites. You know, I, I did everything wrong as a nurse. Okay. I didn't react right away. I didn't take the right pain medication. Then I drove myself. Could you imagine that to the clinic? Lucky I made it there safely. Um, and then next thing I know, when I woke up, I'm on a gurney. They have an IV running in me. They gave me all kinds of epinephrine. They gave me medications. And uh, they said, you you had a major reaction to these ambites. And it's like, okay, lesson learned. <laughs> You'd never drive yourself, right? Oh, my gosh. But I, I know what that felt like. It was a horrible feeling. So anyways. That's besides the point. <laughs> anyway, well, listen, guys, I do have to let you go. Thank you so much for your wonderful attention. I hope we learned something today, especially about testing strategies, how to look at questions and go and read the instructions, knowing how to distinguish what the question is asking and what the answer should be. So you can see this one again tomorrow if you want to come back and try it again with jeremy otherwise you guys have a wonderful day stay safe until next time again this is susie caldero with today's webinar thank you so much i appreciate your attention bye everybody <laughs> now you know more about me than than i wanted to know <laughs>